Welcome to Princess and the Pea podcast, the show that supports neurodivergent women and gender diverse folk exploring the lives of autistic and ADHD minds. We talk about everything from employment to mental health, parenting, and more, all with a neurospicy lens. I'm your host, Annie Crow, and I'm an autistic ADHDer who likes to talk a lot about neurodiversity. And today's guest is another neurospicy diva who talks almost as much as I do. Would you believe it? Please welcome to the microphone, talented, hilarious, truth bringer, Alana. Not only was she diagnosed with ADHD at 39 years old, but she wrote a book about it and published it less than a year later. Trust an ADHD to hyperfocus on their interest of the day. Alana's book is called Talks Too Much and is available on Amazon, in paperback or Kindle, and soon will be out as an audiobook as well. Very accessible. When Alana isn't avoiding rewashing the same load of clothes for the 87th time, she enjoys hanging out in Perth, Western Australia, with her husband, two boys, two brutals, and the boss of the house, of course, a kitten called Freckles. An avid setter of goals she will never reach, an accomplished starter of projects she will never finish, Alana is a proud advocate of ADHD and autistic humans, particularly women and mothers. She is currently in the process of seeking an autism diagnosis to add to her neurodivergent repertoire for some extra spice. We do not have a listener question of the week for you today because, well, we talk too much. But get ready for a jam-packed episode discussing late diagnosis, imposter syndrome, recruitment and employment, parenting and more. Before we kick off, I just wanted to add a quick content warning for little ears. This podcast will be discussing mental health issues and serious adult business. So chuck on your headphones, grab a cup of tea, and as Bluey likes to say, let's do this. Hi, Alana. Thanks for being here today. It's great to have you on the show as our first guest. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I thought we could start with talking about how you even came about being on my show because I think it's a really interesting story. Um, When I started this podcast, I was just doing some marketing and reaching out to people, hoping to God someone would want to come on it because I just want to talk to cool people. So I was just fleshing out the idea and wanting to get the ball rolling and I'd asked a couple of lovely people that are that will be on the upcoming episodes um and they thankfully all said yes and you were the first person who actually reached out to me and said if you want someone on your podcast she was me and I was so happy um because I had already bought your book <laughs> hadn't read it yet but you know story of my life never ending reading list that's why I bought you on first because you are aligned with why I even started this podcast. And I, I think, you know, having read your book, which everyone should read, I, I loved where you put it about uh, wanting to help even just one woman not have to go through what, what you did slash we did. And it's pretty much why why I do what I do. So yeah, I guess we could start off with why did you write a book? <laughs> See, I remember as me forcing myself on you to make make you have me on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so you're very, very no, generous. Definitely not. <laughs> um, I mean, it would have been if I didn't want yeah. you there, but I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> that worked out well for both of us. Um, so I, yeah, I wrote my book. Um, it probably needs to go back to like where, why I got diagnosed really, which was when um, I started in a job that I thought was going to be great because it was boring. And I discovered that boring is actually not great for me. I was so uncomfortable being bored um, and that was actually what ended up leading to my diagnosis um, funnily enough but being at a boring job meant that I had heaps of time and I actually wrote my book while I was at work so that worked out well for me and the reason I wrote it is because it was actually just started off as a way for me to process everything I find it hard to process things just in my head I needed to write them down to get them out and it was funny and it was making me laugh and I thought oh maybe I could make something out of this Definitely. It made me laugh so much constantly. I remember reading that you wrote, what was it, 60% of it at work? And I just, I thought that was so great that you put that in the book because I'm like, God, I hope her boss didn't read this. (laughs) (laughs) I'm still there now, so I hope they don't hear this either. (laughs) Uh, But also I feel like... uh, I mean, I'm similar to you. I've I've been in a 
I had one or two jobs that were not as challenging as I would have hoped and I was bored out of my brain and had to make work for myself. I mean, I think if anything, if you were like me, you would have been more efficient knowing you just wanted to get back to writing your book. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I would do it as a way to get into the work. So yeah. it was like instead of doing the boring stuff first and rewarding myself, I'd re- reward myself first and then do the boring stuff. Exactly. I mean, I don't know about you, but. With that dopamine Yeah, hit. totally. To- I needed that to get me going. I don't know if you are like me where I go through patches where I work in a really um, challenging job and then I burn myself out and then I go and work in a boring job and then I get bored. <laughs> And it's an endless cycle, <laughs> yep. Which I'm okay with. I, I doesn't. I don't mind. And not the burning out. I'm not keen on that. But I don't mind changing jobs. And I love that we think the solution to the burnout is the boring job, which we know it's not. But like we have to do that so many times to realize it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. Yeah. No. I. I love that. And. I just think your book is the best. Um, I've read so many firsthand accounts of women with ADHD and autism and I absolutely love consuming that type of content, but yours was by far the funniest I've ever read. It was so good uh, and, and just so relatable, which I also think people will really like. And Australian, which is the best because there's just so much good content coming out of the UK and the US and I just I love that we've got more and more of us coming out down under. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, uh, like I, I do say this in the intro of the book, that, you know, I wanted to find a book that actually talked about how ADHD felt rather than what it was. I talk about that a bit in there, but it, it's more important to me to talk about that feeling because I didn't know that what I was feeling was ADHD. So to be able to then share that with other people and you know yeah absolutely I just wanted like I do say it's such a cliche I wanted one person to read it and it benefit them which it has done which is amazing you know yeah yeah and I think also um I mean you're so right given that ADHD like autism is so underdiagnosed in women and so many people read the diagnostic criteria which is heavily based on studying men (laughs) and presentation in men uh it's not that relatable to us ADHD women and so you know I mean there's so there's such a place for the more academic um books and guidelines and such but I think uh it's so important to hear lived experience from women like us so that others who are sort of questioning their neurospiciness as I like to say (laughs) um can get an actual good picture of what it really is like to live with our brains absolutely yeah because we get fed this stereotype don't we of what it looks like and to me it looked exactly like my son when he was six and you know he was bouncing off the walls and I when I started to think about it for myself it didn't I couldn't meet those two things in the middle. It didn't make sense to me. And it wasn't until I started seeing other people, other creators talking about it that I was like, oh, oh, it looks like that, you know. It doesn't look like the six- or seven-year-old boy in the classroom who can't sit still. So I think it's so important that we just talk, 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 just keep talking about it and get the word out there as much as we can. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that your son is like the cliche little boy hyperactive, which we all get holed up against. Like, you're nothing like my nephew. (laughs) And yet, uh, not only do women more commonly have the inattentive presentation, uh, I have combined, but I'm special. (laughs) Such an overachiever. (laughs) Thank you. I just love labels. Uh, But also, adults uh, don't actually show as much hyperactivity. Even little boys with that hyperactivity, generally by adulthood, it's much less obvious. So, not only you've got the gender picture, but you've also got the age yeah. picture as well in how it shows up differently. So I can totally get why yeah. when your son was diagnosed, you didn't automatically think, oh, that's me, because <laughs> most women don't. <laughs> no. And um, for me, my hyperactivity was internal. So it was something I felt inside of myself. And because, you know, society tells you that women behave and we're quiet and we do the right thing. So that's what we do. And we hide how we're feeling. Yeah. And I just felt awful all the time but I just accepted that's just how I feel absolutely I didn't know that you could feel a different way to that and it's almost like I mean you only know your own experience right so I mean as a kid I always thought maybe everyone's doing this maybe everyone's hiding their true selves and it's just less obvious to me you just don't know any different no because I mean everyone does mask to an extent we all go out in the world and we put on different personas in different environments that's just human nature but to do it to an extent that it drains you physically and emotionally and create such internal turmoil. Mm. I think that's the biggest difference. And that's, I think, really something that doesn't get talked about enough because so much of the discussions people like us have are heard by neurotypicals and they're like, oh, everyone does that. 
right? Yeah. But yeah, because guess what? We're human and like 99.9% of our DNA is actually the same. It's yeah. not that being neurodivergent or having ADHD or autism makes you an alien and completely different. No. Although, I mean, stereotypes in film and such can show that. So I get the disconnect. But, you know, I think people need to understand that our experiences are human. They're just to a different level, a different intensity and a different expression, right? Yeah, it's just so interesting to me the reactions that people can have. There's like different types of people, ones that just go, oh my, wow, that's really interesting. Like I'd love to hear more about that. And those other people that are like, everybody feels like that. It's like, just try, please just try. Like if there's one thing that has been amazing out of this whole thing, it's getting to be part of the neurodiverse community because I have never been in a community that is more accepting and welcome. Like it just feels like coming home. It really does, yeah. Totally agree. Absolutely. And I I think people genuinely think they're complimenting you when they say things like, oh, you're not that bad or everyone does that. I don't think they understand how invalidating it is and dismissive because I don't think like I genuinely don't like these people just don't know. I yeah. mean, you and I didn't know we when we were seeking or looking into diagnosis, this was all completely unknown mm-hmm. to us. So I totally understand why people are like that. And it's such nice intent, but it's just really unhelpful. And I think the more we can get the message out that that's not a polite thing to say. <laughs> and if anything, just respond with, oh, wow, that's yeah. really interesting and ask questions about it or or don't. Actually, that's an interesting one because I was recently visiting some family and I met a family friend who I'd never met before and she immediately after saying hello starts grilling me <laughs> on my autism and ADHD diagnosis. Like, how did you know? What did it look like? Ah. And I felt so like... Bombarded? Yeah, because I mean, I talk about this stuff all the time online and to, you know, professionals and such, and that's totally fine, but it's usually in a pretty controlled yeah. environment and I've had time to prepare. And, and this was just like, I was at a play center with my son and <laughs> there were kids everywhere. I was in sensory overload already oh, and God. I'd never met this woman. I was like, oh, she was so lovely. And I tried, tried to answer it as best I could, but I was just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Because I think that's another thing um, that I hear talked about in like the disability community is like, just be curious and ask questions. And I, I love that sentiment. And it's, you know, I think a really important thing for people to keep the conversation going and to destigmatize all this stuff. But the other thing that I, I think about is, you know, the difference with especially uh, invisible disabilities um, is that they're so personal and it's also like, I mean, you and I spent most of our lives completely hiding all of these traits and mm. now we're expected to openly tell the world what we spent majority of our energy concealing, <laughs> which just blows my mind because people are talking more about, you know, neurodiversity at work, which I love and it's a passion of mine. But at the same time, there's a lot of controversy on disclosure and how so many people still don't feel safe to disclose, which I, I totally understand. Yeah. yeah, I think that another big issue that's not really being talked about much is that it's actually really hard to communicate how our brains work. I think I feel like you've got you feel like you've got to justify yourself. I think. Yes, you know, right. You feel like you've got to be ready to. Ba- you can't just say, "Oh, I've got ADHD" or "I'm autistic." You've yeah. got to be ready to have all the things to say to prove to the person. Mm-hmm. that you do have it and like we've talked about the burden of, it, of education before yes um you know that that shouldn't really be our job to do that we should just be able to say i have adhd or i'm autistic and it just be a thing that we then go either we have a conversation with it about it and it flows and the person's interested yeah, or just, yeah. it's not just an part interrogation of the conversation. <laughs> yes yes it's not your job i liken it to you know people learning about pro- using pronouns Yes. And it's fantastic like this it, because it's such a symbol for people to show that, you know, you're an ally. And so if you liken that to like neurodiversity, there's no really no excuse for people not at least just get a general knowledge. You, right. you know, just, just have a slightly general knowledge. It might not affect you, but I bet you know someone who is neurodiverse. So kind of take some of the burden, please. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And also let it naturally come out. I feel like if you're working with someone, you'll slowly naturally have conversations and interactions where it'll naturally be brought up where you can say, I prefer this way to communicate or this environment is hard for me. 
um, rather than upfront, tell me everything that you need and all the adjustments and also what's your flavor <laughs> of neurodiversity, right? Yeah. Because the other thing that is commonly said in our community is you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, yeah. meaning we're all very unique and individual, which is so mm-hmm. true. But I, I'm sort of scared, I guess, that the flip side of that is going to be workplaces saying, well, uh, what's your version? Which is, again, very interrogation-based, invasive. Yeah. It's just like no one wants to be that vulnerable at work. Most people only show their best selves at work and hide all their weirdness, regardless of being neurodivergent or not. <laughs> Like, you don't go to an interview and say, oh, yeah, I I really struggle to reply to emails on time. (laughs) Yeah, but even the interview process, like, I've got a problem with that. Not everybody interviews well. Like... They, it, it, ne- it actually needs to start before yeah. you even do the interview. You need to be asking people, right, these are the options we've got. What's the best way that you like to be interviewed? It might be over the phone. Like how good would it be if you could pick being over the phone? I mean, I don't really want to talk on the phone either, uh, but like yeah. <laughs> I, need to, I need to pay my bills. <laughs> no, but at the same time, I love that you brought this up because I've literally just listened to an awesome podcast um, interviewing David Smith, um, and he's he's also also based in Canberra like me, and he does like recruitment and everything, and he's got a business called Employ for Ability. It's so cool, and I'm actually interviewing one of his uh, new, very new staffers that's expanding his offices to Sydney, and she is neurodivergent herself. She's coming on the podcast at a later date, which is very exciting. But he was talking, uh, so he talks a lot about recruitment processes and how interviews are so not neurodivergent friendly which I could not agree more on but also the jobs themselves though like there's heaps of I I was looking at jobs at disability uh, employment places oh yeah and they're looking for people to work there all the jobs how is that flexible like that's not flexible and I actually complained to them and they're like oh well we'll let the you know whoever know and I was like is it going to make a difference yeah it's not accessible at all And it's so intimidating to apply for a full-time job and ask to be part-time. Yes. That's just, it's like you just almost know you're going to get told no. And that's not necessarily true, but it just feels that way. David was talking about um, this study that was done where I think he, I think he was actually involved in it and they were trying to recruit um, autistic people into this tech workplace. Um, I'm probably butchering this, but along the lines of um, they got like 30 something people apply and I think maybe eight of them were neurodivergent and they narrowed it down to five to interview and they did the interviews and the guy who came fifth so he did the he bombed in his interview um he ended up getting the job because they all did a day in the life experiment where they did the job they were getting interviewed for in real time for a day and this guy completely just owned the work and was phenomenal oh that gives me goosebumps I love that. How cool is that? And the employers said at the end of it, we would never have hired this guy. And yet he is exactly what we wanted and needed, which is just another amazing example of why this stuff needs to change and become far more flexible and accessible to all people, not just us. Uh, I just, yeah, I love that so much. It just warms my heart to hear that things like that are actually happening out there. So cool. Uh, Just going back to what you were saying about the disclosure at work as well, Mm. you know, the thing is if you're going to disclose to somebody, it needs to be with someone who you are actually comfortable and safe with. Yes. You know, it's not necessarily going to be the HR person or your immediate boss, you know, and until people sort of have a better understanding of that, there's a real barrier. Absolutely, and I think that's so important, like the trust factor Mm. Um, and also like taking into account who's writing your reports, who's critiquing you, who can you trust, who can be more of a mentor or like a coach. I think people are just so focused on the immediate supervisor or HR. Yeah. And yet, you know, I feel like a lot of us would be more comfortable talking to more of a like similar colleague that's not our direct chain of command to yeah. bring my military speak back in. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, we're doing what we always do, which is get sidetracked, <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> it's all so important. So um, back to your beautiful book and your journey to diagnosis. What was it like? I know you said, um, and I'm, I'm not going to do any spoilers, people, but I know you said early on in the book that it was after your son was diagnosed, like quite a while after um, a celebrity came out as um, ADHD online and you really related to her and it was like a big sort of push for you to go seek your own diagnosis. Can you tell us a bit more about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was about uh, a year after my son was diagnosed. Even though I was reading the book about ADHD and relating to every single thing in there, I still just ignored it for 12 months. Um, yes, yeah, so I yeah I saw her just speaking out about it and she it, I was just like, oh, I want that clarity. Like everything she's saying makes so much sense to me and I want that clarity. And that was kind of like, and, and I guess part of that was a bit of the motivation behind the book as well because I thought, well, if I saw her doing that and it made me think I'm going to go and get diagnosed, then perhaps I can, you know, have the same effect on somebody else. So um, I was really lucky with my diagnosis. I've got a great GP and she was going to refer me to a psych, but I just went and found my own psych and then I was like, can you just refer me to him? <laughs> Uh, and he specializes in adult ADHD so oh, amazing um, yeah he was just brilliant so um and you mean psychiatrist right because yeah what did I, I say no you just said psych some people I'm just class oh, psychiatrist yeah sorry yeah because yeah. you know meds right yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah and I, I got diagnosed um in the first two sessions and then I started medication straight away so good so and then yeah just it's just I cannot believe that I struggled for as long as I did yeah I, did, I didn't know how much I was struggling until I had something to compare it to because up until that point, that was just how my life was. I didn't know there was another way of living. I knew I was different. I knew that there was something else going on, but I just yeah. just thought that's just how I live. Yeah, but it got to the point where I was like, I actually can't do this anymore. I'd be, you know, burnout after burnout, panic attacks, just, you know, n- not not good. And I was just, I'm such an advocate for good mental health. Why was I not putting myself first? Well, I mean, you didn't know first off. I didn't know, but I should have had suspicions seeing as my son got diagnosed. But anyway, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Are you being hard on yourself? Well, I suppose that's me putting myself back there, I think, because. True. Okay. You know, that that's, yeah, that's one of the biggest things that I have taken from this. I thought that when I started medication that I would be like way more organized and I'd get everywhere on time and I'd concentrate on work. And, you know, I basically thought I was going to become neurotypical. I just thought, right, I'm going to take the medication. I'm going to become neurotypical. Yeah. That obviously did not happen. If anything, I feel like I became more neurodiverse yeah. because I realized that that idea of becoming neurotypical was not the point. The point was not the end game. No, it, the point was I didn't feel like absolute crap for the first time in my life. I had enough space in my brain to actually be nice to myself for the first time in my life. Yeah. So all of those things that I thought I was going to care about, I didn't care about because I could be nice to myself. Oh, it's just a revelation. Rings true to my my own experience so much. Yeah. It's funny how you say how lucky you were. I just I also say that when I talk about my own diagnosis experience and it just almost makes me sad that we had to be lucky to get the help we did. And it really breaks my heart that most women aren't diagnosed until they're at literal breaking point after many burnouts and so much extra struggle that was so unnecessary. Yeah. We need to be getting to a point where women are being, girls are being diagnosed for starters, not just women, <laughs> like get them in early yeah. so that we understand our brains better, you know, not to the point where we all break down because it's so common for women to seek a diagnosis after their children are diagnosed, but also in like big life transitions. Yeah. So those sort of things that are really altering are just really common for us to sort of break under pressure. Not saying that we do break under pressure because it's I I mean, you and I love pressure, don't we? <laughs> we thrive under pressure. Yeah, absolutely. Like a phoenix, <laughs> rise from the ashes. <laughs> I think also as well, though, there's so much misinformation out there or, or there's also prof- medical professionals who don't have the knowledge required but don't admit they don't have the knowledge. Oh, Instead, they... Yep. You know, there's so many stories about people being misdiagnosed with things and then they find out 10 years later that the whole time it was ADHD or Or autism, autism, you know. Yeah, Yeah. both. It's just, it's just, that makes me feel so sad because I feel like a lot of them are not listened to. They're just, Mm. just not listened to. Yeah. And did you find when you were going for your diagnosis, were you like me and reading all about it and consuming as much information as you could? Yeah. I think in doing that, you and I were both very aware of how hard it is to be diagnosed as a woman. So I I walked into my GP armed at the ready (laughs) with with the (laughs) the diagnostic criteria for ADHD and every example I could link to it. (laughs) Funny you should say that because 
I actually just did that last night. So we haven't actually uh, touched on this yet. Um, but since drum roll. <laughs> Since being diagnosed with ADHD, I have started to realise that I am autistic. Mm. So I went to the GP last night and I had literally 50 pieces of paper. I don't so know, autistic, I, don't know, I love what it. What am I doing? And I held, she's just laughed. She's amazing. And so she listened to everything and I know, yeah. like so overprepared. Yeah. But in the end, I only read her like five things because she was just, she just got it, you know. That's that thing though. I actually, even though I know she is really accepting and understanding, I actually got a little bit upset before the appointment. I said to my husband, it's so weird as an adult to feel like you have to go and prove something about yourself that you pretty much know is true. And even though I pretty much knew she was going to be on my side, you, you still don't know. Absolutely. It's really nerve wracking. It's hard. It's hard to get to the point to go, I need help. Was she the same GP as the ADHD? Yes. Yeah, cool. So you yeah. already knew that she was supportive of that and you still had that feeling. So I, yeah, yes. I, I totally get that. I had that too. Yeah. Oh. So imagine feeling like the person's not going to listen to you. Yeah. That would be just awful it's it's not it's not good no and also people i think this is changing slowly thanks to the internet yeah. but people still really put doctors on a pedestal and there's so many people that like i still see people online being like oh you know i went i, I went to be diagnosed and i didn't have it so and you're saying stuff that i do so you probably don't like <laughs> and when i see that sort of thing i'm like you should find another doctor <laughs> you know what i mean yeah 100% because doctors, like you said, you said it so well, uh, just that they don't admit what they don't know. And yeah. so many of them just don't know how ADHD and autism look in women. And it's just like all the stories you hear about women being turned away because, oh, you couldn't be autistic because you're married or you have friends or you have a job. Like what? <laughs> oh, my God. It drives Is that me in the crazy. diagnostic criteria? Show me, please. And also, like, give me a diagnostic criteria, which is actually catered towards women who are clearly highly intelligent because we can cover this stuff up. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we need... A criteria that like actually applies to us absolutely Even, I mean, you and I have had chats before about you know because you can do the online tests and stuff but <laughs> Even that, yeah. I'm like, I need more details about this question. I'm yes. sorry. like, what, And they're what they so vague. Yeah. So vague. And, like, I don't want those options. I want another option to take. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or which which environment do you mean that in? Because I'm different in different environments. <laughs> like, seriously. And also what person are you referring to? Because, like, it's fine. Like, it's, there was one about hugs. Oh, like, yeah. doesn't like hugs. And I'm like, I love hugs with my husband, but I don't want to hug, hu like, scary old creepy Uncle Harry, you know? Like, it's different people. <laughs> I don't have an Uncle Harry, by the way. I love that you made <laughs> up an uncle name. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. The ICD-11, which is the World Health Organization International Classification of Diseases, actually mentions masking in the autism criteria. Whereas the DSM-5-TR, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatry Association, is far more limited. And overall, I would say the ICD-11 criteria is more progressive than the DSM-5-TR, mm. which saddens me because we mostly focus on DSM and DSM mm. is just changing at a snail pace. Dr. Michael B. First, uh, editor and co-chair of the latest DSM-5 update, was interviewed in March when the update came out and actually commented on how autism is currently overdiagnosed. <laughs> and most of the autistic community, including many researchers and specialists, were just clawing their eyes out at that comment because it's so inaccurate. Well, it's accurate in terms of we are all being more diagnosed, but it's inaccurate in in terms of it being some kind of like we need to gatekeep it more. Yeah, like an epidemic that we've got to like keep under control. Yeah. I'm sorry. You mean people who have always been autistic are finally learning they're autistic because doctors are actually starting to become a little bit more woke about what it looks like, especially in women and gender diverse people? Yeah. Oh my goodness. We're not just like being let out of a box all of a sudden and we're like all creeping around the yeah, streets. exactly. Like, you know? Pick me, pick me. <laughs> and also like the, the diagnostic cr criteria as well, me thinking about having to go and be diagnosed now, there's such a it, – it's like having to do an overhaul of your whole life because I've now got to go back and look at what I consider normal and somehow frame it in a way to somebody that says, 
but it's not normal. You know what I mean? That's normal to me. Going through all of my life experiences and going, oh, yeah. oh. Whenever I talk about people, because one of my special interest is people, like people, human behavior, I just love it. And I always talk about like types of people. And I say to my mum or my husband, you know, I just don't like that person because they just always leave a space after they've finished talking. They just make me feel uncomfortable. You know, I've realized now they're waiting for me to be part of the conversation and I'm not picking up on it because I don't, for whatever reason, I don't like them. And that gap is supposed to be for me to fill. And I've only just realized that. And I have said that my whole life. (laughs) So funny. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. I had the, so many aha moments. And I just <clears throat> I just love that I mean, we we both similarly went for our ADHD diagnosis first and I was so lucky to get diagnosed with both at the same time, but so many women get diagnosed with autism far later than they do with their ADHD. And and yeah. I'm not saying everyone has both. It's just very co-occurring. But I think, you know, it's so important to talk about how this has come about for you and I know spoiler alert she's writing another book. Yay. Um, but you know, this, this process is so critical to document because I think it's, it's much more socially acceptable to be an ADHD than it is to be autistic. And basically all that means is that autism is even less likely to be known about than ADHD, except for the extreme stereotypes that you immediately brush off because there's no way you could be like that. And yet, you know, the presentation of just ADHD or just autism is very different to a presentation of combined because a lot of the traits from either can counteract each other. I like to talk about how, you know, I always want routine and certainty and structure and yet can never organize myself to consistently do it. (laughs) Yeah, no matter how many journals I buy. (laughs) Don't get me started about journals. (laughs) I know. No, that was a little subtle um, comment because I I love that part of your book that talks about journals. I've also bought a thousand bullet journals and every kind of journal and just either never used them or completely failed very quickly. Yeah. Um, now I'm on to apps and I'm still trying to find something that will help, yeah. but we'll see. That will help for more than like a week at a time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's funny um, like you talking about like the comor- comorbidity, is that how you say it? Yeah, but I, I feel like people like the term okay, co-occurrence the more because comorbidity is like negative and def- deficit oh, and pathologizing. I so I say I tried I try to say co-occurring. Well, I know what you mean. I it took it took me ages to figure out how to actually pronounce comorbid. I just couldn't pronounce it. So that's why I just said it. Okay, co-occurring. I love that. Um, yeah, so the co-occurrence of um, ADHD and autism. So the way that I, I'd already started to think about autism. And then, yeah, you one day you just sent me a message, which I love in true, like the <laughs> blunt style, and you just said to me, so have you been diagnosed as autistic or are you self-diagnosed? And I was like, well, funnily enough, I've actually been thinking about that for a while. So, you know, it's interesting that you yeah. say that. Um, and you said, well, reading your book, it's given me strong indicators for the fact that you might be autistic. And I've mm-hmm. since gone back and read my book again. I've skim read it. Good I, on I, you. No, I've skim read it. I didn't read it, mate. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I couldn't even bring myself to read. I shouldn't say that. I was going to say that's I. brave. No. I mean, it's an excellent book, but I can't read my own stuff. No, I, I looked at the. I looked at the, the chapter headings. <laughs> Self criticism comes out. Yeah, I like your chapter heading. It makes so much sense now. Actually, I was going to say what one of them is, but I have to swear, so I won't say <laughs> it. Um, yeah, we're, we're keeping it, read it PG here, peeps. Yeah, <laughs> but there were so many things in there that I'm like, yeah, that's probably not ADHD. Like, yeah. or a, a, yeah. It's a combination at least. Mm. There was so many things that I had just attributed to that mm. and now I have to write a follow-up book. And that's okay. Like, that's okay that I thought that. Oh, 100%. That, that doesn't matter. I th- yeah. You said to me that it's not my job to educate everybody perfectly, basically. Mm, and mm. and the reason I'm going to do it the way I'm doing it with my next book is, you know, to show that journey because I would say that is a very, very common journey. So common. Yeah. And also, as you would know, um, there's so much content online in the ADHD world that borrows autistic traits and calls them ADHD traits traits. Yes. I mean, I 
did the exact same thing. Yeah. I walked into my psychiatrist appointment and was so confident I had ADHD, hadn't even considered autism. And again, I try and think back, I'm like, how much of that was me seeing it referred to and just immediately thinking there's no way versus it not being mentioned. But I've now gone back and looked at it and there's so much content that just borrows from autism and calls itself ADHD. So it totally makes sense why people like you and I don't think that we're autistic yeah. and I just, you know, hone in on the ADHD aspect. And yeah, so I was reading your book and just relating so much and we just talked sort of as if you were similar and yeah. it had never really come up. So I was like, seriously, are you? <laughs> like, have you been diagnosed? <laughs> we yeah. clear this up. Are you one of us? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You're already one of us as an adhd <laughs> Welcome to the club. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny because when I went to get diagnosed for ADHD, I actually didn't really talk about a huge mm. thing that played in my life, which was my meltdowns. I just thought mm. I was a really angry person. So I thought that this is horrible, but I basically blamed my kids because I was like, my kids are so annoying. Like it's their fault. And it wasn't until I've just recently, I had a meltdown and I had the name for it this time. And it was just mind blown because I knew why I was doing what I was doing and it wasn't my fault. And I'm sure that I can learn tools to help me and all that kind of stuff. But Oh, absolutely. You saw it in a different light. Yes. I thought I was an angry person. Mm, No way. I'm I'm not an angry person. I'm just someone who struggles with, for me, it was sensory overload. And then that just built and built and built and built. And instead of recognizing the signs, it just blew. Mm. And Mm -hmm. yeah, it was really interesting to realize that, yeah, it's not that I'm like a tempestuous or angry person. I just need some help with some stuff. Yeah. And it's funny because I I also had no idea about meltdowns, even though I've had them all my life. Now that I actually know what they are. Yeah. (laughs) I just thought it was like being emotional. I hate that. I hate that so much. Drama queen, whatever. You're just trying to get attention. That's what I used to get. Yeah. Same. Oh my God. You just, you just want everyone to think about you. It's all about you. (laughs) No. I mean, it's not, it's not wrong. (laughs) Not fully, (laughs) but still. (laughs) No, but meltdowns, I don't, even even looking at how people describe meltdowns now online, there's still quite often times where I'm like, no one's really talking about the way I have meltdowns that much. Yep, same. Yeah, and I don't know if that's just, it's not been really that clear to people or maybe it's there's more shame in it or it's harder to distinguish, but my meltdowns it usually goes one of two ways. I'm either like extremely emotional and crying or I'm very angry and verbally abusive to my loved ones generally because we only melt down. I only melt down in front of my loved ones because that's safe, right? Yeah. And it's really hard. Yeah. My husband is so on top of it and he, like even before I knew I was autistic, he totally knew what was happening and mm. was very supportive, thank goodness. But my poor parents <laughs> still don't. It's really hard for them to tell when I'm just in a shitty mood or I'm on the verge of a major meltdown slash in one. (laughs) Yeah. Because, I mean, we all get shitty sometimes and we can all get snappy. That's normal. But when it becomes like a you're blaming others and saying really nasty things that just don't align with your your true self and your values and what you Mm -hmm. truly think. Mm Mm-hmm. It's so hard for the people around you to understand that that's you struggling. Like I almost wish that my meltdowns were more stereotyped, I don't know, obviously screaming on the floor or whatever, like yeah. just because then it would be really obvious to my loved ones that I was struggling, whereas it's still so hard to pick and I'm not mm. in a state of mind where I can say I'm having a meltdown because <laughs> usually I don't know it at the time. Obvious, Goodbye, yeah. prefrontal cortex. Hello, amygdala. But I just find it so hard because they'll then get angry back at me <laughs> because I'm usually being so unreasonable it's totally legit but also that just makes everything so much worse yeah and it just escalates yep so I just really wish that more people like and I hope this starts being talked about more because I I feel like it's probably more common especially in women but yes you know those of us who are hyperverbal or whatever you want to call it that that's how it can come across Mm -hmm. is that like you well a hundred percent like the the verbally angry my poor children, unfortunately, suffer the brunt of it. It's actually mainly my older one because he's really thick-skinned. And so he was the one that the one the other day was directed towards and I feel really horrible about it. But mm. just listening to you talking about, you know, the way that your parents deal with it. So what I did was... as 
as soon as I realized what had happened afterwards and I knew how in the wrong I was because it was honestly about just such a small thing that I was focusing on what that wasn't the cause of it but that's what I was focusing on that something he had done and so I actually sat down with him afterwards and I just spoke to him about it and said look Mm -hmm. you know you know how like I think that it's possible that I'm autistic that was actually a meltdown and you know what it is is this that and the other and I explained it to him and my kids are freaking awesome because I talk to them about everything absolutely everything so both of them have ADHD such a boss mum you know they're gonna grow up just knowing that people are different and that's okay you know I'll talk to them about how they could help in that situation and I'm trying to change history really by parenting in a really really different way Mm, and like some people would see that and think that is horrific but there's probably lots of autistic people who would see that and really relate to it and my son just gets it like he just gets it he's cool he's 12 Like he just, yeah, he just moved on to the next subject so quickly after being screamed at like that because I could just tell him about why my brain works the way it works. So absolutely, you know, and you you're just teaching him how to be human, right? Totally. So, but would you talk to your parents about it? Yeah, oh, I do oh, so much. The more we talk about it and the more I, I get, you know, the, the more I understand myself, yeah. the more I can explain it to them and slowly they're getting better at picking it up, which is so good um, and I appreciate them <laughs> very much. But interesting you say that about your kids because with my toddler, uh, I, I've i obviously had a few meltdowns since he has been blessed this earth mm-hmm. and when that first happened in front of him when he was tiny, I took myself into another room and was like, I don't want him to see me like this and yeah. and I was so scared that when he got older it would be so much harder to hide because you know sometimes I can like really loudly be crying or yelling at my husband and I don't want him to see that but Ben yeah. my husband has shown me it's not about what you do in front of them it's about how you recover from it and he needs to know that it's okay to have feelings a hundred percent and it's okay to express yourself even if sometimes it's not in the most kind and helpful way and yeah. so now I don't hide it and actually no. the other day uh, my son's almost 15 months old and I was crying and he came up to me and gave me a big hug and snuggled into me Aww, and I was like oh see? my goodness you are the best see that's so cute oh it's so cute there's a great book by Eliza Hull so many amazing Australian disabled parents in it and it's all about being a parent with a disability and she talks about how kids that are, have parents with a disability tend to be so much more compassionate kind wonderful humans <laughs> yeah. because they've they've seen so much 100% my son I've got a really cute story about this my 12 year old oh yeah so tell me, tell me. his friend was coming away on holidays with us recently and he my son found out that his friend gets a little bit homesick and gets really uncomfortable being away my son googled and sent him links of tips of how to make yourself feel comfortable when you're away from home goodness bless this is a 12 year old kid kids his age are vaping oh my goodness my kid's like, he, yeah, he's a confident kid, you know. And I said to him, do you know how special that is? That number one, your friend t- felt like he could tell you that, which is hard. You're 12-year-old boys. That's hard. So he knew he could tell you that and you wouldn't judge him. You didn't judge him. And then you sent him ideas of what he could do to make him more comfortable. That is freaking cool. Yes. Like that is so cool. Yeah. And then you actually helped. <laughs> It's amazing. Why can't everyone be like your son? <laughs> that is the best. And so I always try and pick those things and really make a big deal about them because you can keep your nap plan and I will take that, friend, I will take that any day. Like keep your nap plan <laughs> and I will take my son's kindness over that yes. any day yep. of the week. Like that's life. That's real life, oh, you know? Yeah. So true. So you letting your son see that is it's really important. Yeah. I let my kids see absolutely everything. They are woke. My kids are woke. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Yay to the woke kids. Keep keep doing it. <laughs> oh, I'm just I'm coming to you for more parenting advice. I'm so glad I'm following your footsteps. <laughs> Well, I actually started writing a parenting book, but I got distracted. Oh my God, you should. Once you finish the second book, go write that again. I'm very passionate about that because I feel so, so sad for children who are really misunderstood. Oh, me too. I mean, being one of them myself. (laughs) I don't know if you've seen, I think it's Russell Barkley and he talks about. Oh yeah, he's great. Yeah. And he says, 
kids don't want to be bad for want yeah. of a better term. I keep holding my fingers up and you can see my fidget. When <laughs> kids don't want to be bad. They want to be good and they want to please you. So if they're not, there's a reason behind it. So I'm very passionate about that. Yeah, they're not just terrible. No, nobody is. Yeah, that, we should um, collab. I've been writing a book about pregnancy for autistic women because oh, awesome. when I was pregnant, when I was pregnant, I Googled uh, autistic and pregnant <laughs> and got like hundreds of articles saying how to avoid having an autistic child in pregnancy. What? Terrible fake articles about, you know, avoid honey type of thing. What the hell? That is horrible. <laughs> That's so hyperbolic. And I was like, where's the stories of all the women that are autistic having kids? Because there's a lot of us, although most don't know that they're autistic till post kids. So that's probably why there's lack of those stories. And I was just oh, in pregnancy. I mean, I read everything, mm. watch everything, listen to everything. As a, It's sort of a way I manage my anxiety. It's like the more I know, the more secure I feel. Yeah. <laughs> but there was nothing. Like I think maybe there was one or two really basic YouTube channels about women and their experience, but it was barely anything. And mm. I was just like, where is this? There's mm. so many of us and there's nothing so I just decided I'd start to write one about my own, but obviously mine's just one experience and, and I feel like mine's, I don't know, I always fe- feel like I'm too too complicated to, to write about. It doesn't about. matter. People take, people no, take true. what they need to take. They don't have to be exactly, exactly the same as you to benefit from it. It's still true. a valuable story. Absolutely. And in saying that, I feel like ugh, I constantly try and just question that belief because a lot of us are complicated yep. and they might not be complicated in the same way, but at least they'll feel less alone in their complications. A lot of people that do talk online are very homogenous mm. in their appearance. Uh, and by appearance, I mean like they're just autistic yep. and very autistic yep. or they're just ADHD and it's a very stereotyped So you version. need to get on TikTok. That's what you're, right? you're on the wrong platform. I That's know. where they all are. All the, <laughs> like, all, oh, mate, it, like people have say bad things about TikTok, but yeah. if you want a place where all the neurodiverse people are showing up in every single way oh my that's, god that's where it's at so good i have heard that i do need to get on i just already like lose myself down the instagram rabbit hole <laughs> often yeah. and facebook but yeah no i i definitely need to hit that bandwagon and and in saying that like there's so many more people now coming out with more complex presentations and yeah and i do i love that this is shifting towards people like us coming out that aren't just mm-hmm. one thing and i mean yeah <sighs> It's so rare. I think, I can't remember the statistics, but it's something like 90% of autistic people have a co-occurring condition like anxiety or Mm -hmm. ADHD or whatever. So, you know, we're clearly more the norm than not uh, in being complicated. But, yeah, I definitely think. Yeah. I was going to say I think it's important for, like, people like you and people like me to uh, openly tell our story I see it as us paving the way for people younger than us you know to be able to see somebody and go oh I can relate to that you know Mm. and I think we just we need every creator who wants to create to create just keep creating there's never going to be enough no we need to like saturate the market yeah 100 (laughs) percent like there's like one you know young girl who's you know maybe 17 and she's going through all these things and she hasn't really t- told anybody about it and she's really worried and then she sees one of us talking and goes, oh, what will they look like? You know, they've at least learnt about themselves and, you know, they've had children and, you know, that can change somebody's story. So it's important that you tell the story if you think it's co- too complicated or not. No, I totally agree and I think it's so important to question people's stereotypes and bias. I have a history of having an eating disorder and uh, it's one of my special interest areas trying to advocate for especially autistic girls because we make up so like 30 to 35 percent of people with eating disorders but neurodiverse humans neurodivergent humans in, in general with eating disorders because generally the way that they need to be treated and the way they present are so different to what's considered normal presentations of eating disorders and so I do a lot of uh, advocacy work in this space and uh, on one of the groups that I'm on mm-hmm. there's a lot of mums talking about their daughters with anorexia and some of them are aware that their ch- their daughters are autistic and some aren't not saying that everyone with it is but like it's one of the most common to have um if you are autistic and 
the ones that talk about their daughters who are autistic with anorexia nervosa, they talk about it in such mm. a negative way and like it's happening to them like their the child's behavior is happening to them rather than their child is struggling yeah yes yeah and like it's like their choice to be the way that they are and think the way that they are and it's just and I, I totally get why it's ha- why that happens because if you think about the medical system and the pathologizing medical model of diagnostic criteria and such it, it's so common to come across these diagnoses and see it in such a negative deficit based light so mm-hmm. i can understand why these parents who have probably seen a pediatrician that diagnosed their daughter who just told them about all the problems with being autistic Mm. have Mm. these views. But I also feel like so strongly that people like us need to share our story because we're the stories that aren't being commonly shared, which is there is equally, as with all humans, so many wonderful things about being autistic and ADHD as there are challenges. And, And I'm not a proponent of, you know, we're superheroes or, you know, we're the next form of evolution or anything. Like, I think that's ridiculous. But I equally do like to focus more on the positive just because so much of what is currently out there is focused on the negative mm. and the deficits. 100%. And, and just and the shame. Yeah, and the shame. The shame. Oh, my gosh. The yeah. shame. And also, like, just from a mental health perspective and a mental wellness perspective, can you imagine? I mean, yes, you can because you're like me. <laughs> But, like, can anyone imagine what it would be like to find out this information about yourself and just hear all the bad things? And, like, what what does that do to your your identity and your self-image? I mean, we live most of our – you and I live most of our lives not even knowing those labels, and we still had an awful image, you know, because we just saw we were different. We couldn't quite identify why or how. Hmm. We tried to hide it, tried to fit in, hated ourselves for it. Yeah. And then you get the diagnosis, which, you know, for us and many neurodivergent people, it's the greatest thing ever because it just gives us access to supports and understanding ourselves better and being able to communicate our needs better, all the good things. And so I just wanted to say what happened. I want to share with everyone because I love this so much is when I said that you were autistic and you were like, oh, my God, like, that's awesome. Yeah, well, I said to you, I I said to you, I've got a bit of imposter syndrome about this because I, yeah, like, I really want to be autistic. Like, that just makes sense to me. But I don't want people to think I'm trying to be cool, trying to be part of the cool club. And you go to me, Alana, (laughs) if you think being autistic is cool, you are probably autistic. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly right. Because to me, that is such a, it's such a positive thing. I feel very positive about my ADHD and I feel very positive about autism. Yeah, So I felt it's almost, it's actually like a self-esteem thing almost. I don't deserve to have a diagnosis that makes so much sense to me because it makes so much sense to me. How dare I have something that, you know, I can all of a sudden attribute all of my failings. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't deserve to have a name for that, but I do deserve to have a name for that. And it feels really cool because it is the cool club to be, yeah. And then because I, I said to you, I forgot that 95% of the population probably doesn't think that's cool, but because I've been in the neurodiverse world for so long, it feels it is normal cool to you. To me. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and also, and I feel like that just pushes the point that it's being in the neurodivergent community is for you and I, we're seeing so much more neurodiversity affirming stories and, and experiences being shared. And so much of that is not seen by the ma- like the majority of the population. So when they hear about about these diagnoses they just think oh my god all the bad all the deficits yeah which you know I, again I totally understand it's taken me years to understand how many good things also come with those deficits so it, yeah. yeah it's just it's mind-blowing really I just thought it was so funny that you thought that it was cool <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, sister. <laughs> it just, I said to my GP last night, it actually feels like coming home. Yes. That's what it feels like to me. It feels like I'm coming home to a place where everybody is like me in their own way and, yeah, they're just accepting. I, they understand yeah. me. And I'm the sort of person that I can't just get diagnosed privately. I have to document the whole entire process and make constant TikToks about it because yes. – I I liked I love doing that. I've always been in drama and stuff like that as a kid, but I also just want to represent. 
So, for example, one of my pet hates is when people use ADHD as a describing word. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, that's a bit OCD type of thing. Yes. Yeah. A parent, um, so I'm a, a softball and T-ball coach. Oh, yeah. And a parent said, oh, God, those kids are just are so ADHD today. Oh, no. And I love, no, it's my favourite because I go, oh, I'm ADHD. <laughs> and they go, I just love their fa- the I face. I it's so awkward. Just, it's the, yes. And I'm like, but you're being rude. So if you're uncomfortable now, that is actually your own problem. And then they go, oh, no, you, not you. You can't be. <laughs> and then I like to go, why? <laughs> Everyone needs to if copy ever, this. <laughs> y- yes. Like yeah. I'm, we're not, I'm not going to pretend like and just be polite and no, if you're going to be rude, I'm going to educate you. So yeah. that's why I do everything out loud and mm-hmm. and also because my son, my little one, he just thinks it's the coolest thing ever. Like he's proud of himself because he because it yeah, is. He goes, um, you wouldn't even know if it wasn't for me. Okay, mum, I paved the way, so <laughs> you know, like I'm the best. <laughs> I gave you the answers. <laughs> yes, and he listens to everything I say, and he'll go, oh yeah, like so that's you know when your brain works like this. I'm just so passionate about being loud about it. I disclosed at work. I considered not disclosing. And then I thought, what example am I giving to my children if I'm hiding something that is the same as them? I want them to be able to live in a world where it's not even a thing. And so I told people. Yeah, I think that's so important. And like, obviously, I think you and I have a bit of privilege there being older and a little bit more established in our careers that, you know, I don't want young people listening to this and feel shamed that they, not that I'm saying that was your intention, but I just, no, 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 I'm thinking about like young me listening would have been like, you don't have to so embarrassed that I wasn't comfortable sharing, but I think, no, I don't share it when I'm going for a new job. Like if I'm, if I'm applying for a job, I don't share. I want to so badly because I hate I hope we get to that yes, one day. Yes, I don't like. <laughs> like where it's normal. Well, because my problem is I did disclose when I applied for a few jobs, okay? So you know how at the bottom of a job ad it says we welcome people from all, you know, yeah. in- this, that, and the inclusion. I, being autistic, took that literally. <laughs> cool. Well, they want people who are dis- disabled. So I yeah. was like, well, I'm a person with lived experience thinking they're going to love this. And yeah. I was not getting any interviews. Oh, my goodness. And I had to learn that I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I'm not ashamed and I don't want to hide it, I have to hide it if I want to get past the first because they don't see who I am. They literally just see that. That's the only thing they'll see. Yeah. And they won't meet me. Yeah. So it's it's, it's really sad. Yeah. And, oh, it's so sad. And we've talked before about uh, tokenism yeah. and uh, businesses setting percentages that they want. Oh, God, don't. It's my biggest oh. pet hate. I know. <laughs> I hate it so. And it just reminds actually, me of that, though. Oh, it makes um, me so angry. It's like, same. I don't care about your percentages. And I've yeah. said that in meetings. So I work in an area that's like, and I've, I've managed to find myself in like the disability and inclusion area. And you know, the, of course, you these, of course. <laughs> these meetings <laughs> and they're talking about the percentage and I'm like, um, sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they'll be like, oh, this will look really good for the business. And I'll be like, um, but what about the fact that it makes life better for people with a disability? Like, and then they just always come back to that percentage. And also makes yeah. your business better because you're going to get more 100%. innovative, creative thoughts and diversity in your employees. <laughs> my, one of my biggest big bugbears. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Oh, it annoys me so much. And I love you said to me, I remember when we were having a whinge about this, you were saying um, yeah. maybe focus on being an inclusive employer and then the percentage will just naturally rise. Yeah, like you can't <laughs> say that you're inclusive if you're yeah. not. Like, And you're not going to attract exactly. people. For starters, I think it was like 4% or 2% they wanted. And mm. I'm like, I guarantee you that you have got well over 2%, but you yeah. don't have an environment where people are comfortable to disclose. So you're not going to get your percentage. Mm. And before even that, you're not showing that you're a place that people can come to and be given the accommodations they need to. Feeling like safe. You need to go right back to the start and fix that, but they don't mm. they don't get it. Mm-hmm. No, 100%. It's frustrating. They don't. And also there's more and more uh, jobs out now that specifically recruit autistic people. Part of me thinks that's great because we need more accessibility and and more affirmative action. But at the same time, what I've heard through the grapevine is that a lot of them aren't going well and they put all their effort into recruiting Mm. and setting people up 
by introducing them to the role and then basically nothing after that. Just like an entry-level role kind of like? Uh, I don't know if it's more about the role, but it's more um, – so I've heard there's quite a few calm care claims of oh, right. people doing these roles, yeah. getting all excited that they're getting supported in a in, for employment that knows about mm-hmm. them and can – accommodate them and then working out pretty quickly that beyond the initial step there's nothing that's really put in practice which really breaks my heart and I Same. hope I hope that's being addressed so badly and that's the thing that kind of gets me with the whole recruitment percentages that sort of thing it's like yes it's so important to make recruitment more accessible and to smash these mm. unconscious biases and conscious biases and stereotypes and everything that all needs to be done but at the same time let's be focusing on people who are employed and putting supports in place so that they can not only maintain employment but reach their full potential because so much of the autistic community aren't only just unemployed we're also very underemployed and a lot of that is because we're not supported to reach our potential and that's not just harming us but it's harming workplaces that are missing out on so much diverse talent right and it's one of the things that's come up I think with you know everybody having to work from home and and that kind of stuff you know my work says that they are a work friendly kind of place you know like work-life balance but then you kind of get the impression that if you ask to work from home too much that it's a little bit frowned upon and it's like well which is it because I I need to work from home sometimes because I just can't bear the rushing around, the driving, the Mm. talking to people, you know, all of that. Yeah. And so are you giving me work-life balance? And I can't read the nuances either. So I'm like, you, but you said that I could do that, but your face looks angry. Yeah, exactly. But you didn't mean that. (laughs) Yeah. Like, did you mean that or not? Because I took that, you know, verbatim that that's what you meant. But, you know, it's it's confusing. It's clearly not. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oops, sorry. Everybody's angry with me. (laughs) There was a, a thing came out in the UK recently where businesses were saying something like, we're going to pay you less if you work from home. What? And obviously our community is outraged and <laughs> I think everyone's outraged really because businesses are saving on overheads and so many pro- things and getting more efficient employees that aren't distracted by, you know, the coffee cart. That makes no sense. And yet they want to cut costs. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, and thankfully everyone's very outraged, so I don't think that's going to last. But again, it's just showing COVID's been so helpful in terms of forcing the workforce to to be flexible and to try new things. I just really hope mm-hmm. post-COVID, if there is a post-COVID, that these things are maintained and it's still considered normal and acceptable because, I mean, my own experience with working flexibly, flexibly pre and post-COVID has been so, so different and... I've also had a kid in that time. So going back to work now is so much easier to do part-time because everyone understands that most mums work part-time, but no one understood why a girl who seemed fine (laughs) had to not work full-time. And it was so painful for me to have to constantly explain to people why I couldn't. And most of the time I would just use half of the reason, the lesser half, which was I had physical injuries from a car accident that I was in or I'd have surgeries. None of that was not true but yeah. it wasn't really why. Yeah, but no one's going to understand, you know, I'm autistic and full-time work is just not sustainable for me, <laughs> right? I mean, hopefully they do now <laughs> because I'm very vocal about it now. But back then it was so, so hard, whereas I'd see these women yeah. coming back from mat leave and no one questions them. Can we just exactly. not question people it's who want to work th- flexibly? It should not be a thing. And, like, if your work output is still the same and you're still achieving the things mm. you need to achieve, what do- what difference does it make? Mm. And when oh, I love that you said still the same because that reminds me of a part in your book where you talk about how you did cut down on hours and they yeah. paid you the same because you were going to leave. And I did But it. then you were still doing the full-time job. I did it. I just went, okay, yeah, you I'm did. stressed. What I'll do is I'll just buckle down and get even more stressed. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because I, I think people, and it, it's a lot of my mum friends talk about how they work part time and they're expected to do a full time workload still. Yeah, and but, so that's but, but not why, like another why huge would issue. The employer, why would the employer do 
like in my situation, why would they employ somebody else if I'm willing to work myself into the ground to keep up the facade that like everything's amazing and have a breakdown because of it? Why would they employ mm. somebody else? And I would I would mm-hmm. say, and this was when I was undiagnosed, so I would say, I'm really struggling, I need help. And my boss would say, well, with what? And I'd be like, I don't know. I just I just know I need help. Well, what, what, do you, what do you want? I don't actually know because I knew I was struggling, but I didn't know. I, I couldn't say what I struggled with. Yeah. You should go write a list. Write a list. Oh. You couldn't articulate it. And I love how you said, yeah, and go, oh, yeah, go, go use, use Outlook, Outlook Calendar. Calendar I'm like, I use Outlook Calendar. <laughs> Those reminders do not exist to me. <laughs> I can see that they're there, but they yeah. don't exist to me. I remember, do you know what she said to me? She said to me, you know, this is a completely different thing, but she goes, you know, like what? actually it was because she was talking to me about being organised. You know when you finish your toothpaste and you open up a new one and then you immediately write on your yeah. shopping list that you need toothpaste? And I was like, I was like, no, I... What? I don't know that. What I do is I like people squeeze do the that toothpaste until the very last scary and then forget for the next seven days that I need to get toothpaste until just yeah, like until just after I and walk don't in brush the door your teeth, and go, I need toothpaste. But I'm not going back out to get toothpaste. No, sorry, that's not yeah. relatable to me. Like <laughs> No, I, I do two things that are totally in contrast. One is I'll forget and then I'll walk up to the sink to brush my teeth and we'll be like, oh, I have to do this. Must make a note. Forget. Do it again. Do it again. And like constantly. Or I will know that I do this and I'm so anxious about forgetting that I will have 10 to 20 toothpastes in the cupboard because yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just can't remember to get it. But there's, there's, do you know what? There's so things bad. that I cannot get my head around buying. One is greaseproof paper. I don't know why. I use it a lot because I cook the same meal over and over and over again, which is sweet potato in the oven. And I just can't remember to buy greaseproof paper. Yum. That is just one of those things that I know I need it. It just will not like, stick in your brain. Why don't I? No, nah, can't remember it. There's, mm-hmm. there's something else as well, but I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do that with everything as well. And, like, it's funny how there's certain – items that you just know you'll never remember (laughs) and other items there is one or two things that I'm actually not too bad at knowing when they're running out and getting them them, but they have to be something like like you said about the toothpaste (laughs) yeah like (laughs) you frequently have to buy them type of thing and you use them constantly like if they're not constantly on your brain and a priority it's just sometimes I can (laughs) end up actually training myself a little bit so dishwashing liquid was another one but now somehow I've put mm. that importance like in my brain and so I do remember that one and I get it. I've actually got back up now, which is, I mean, I don't want to brag, mm. but like I'm, I'm such an adult. That's <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> oh, I did the thing with the dishwasher tablets where this container has all my dishwasher tablets oh, in it. And see. so it's like a visual reminder That's when genius. I'm out of the dishwasher tablets or close to out. It's so simple. Yes. Like I, I just naturally have to look every time I open. <laughs> I know. And and the, <laughs> people, the neurodiverse people are like, listen, clear containers. <laughs> Neurotypicals listening to this are going to be like, these people are crazy. <laughs> oh, my God. I think that containers are going to change my life every time I buy them. I'm like, this container is going to be the one that fixes it all. <laughs> this is mind blowing. <laughs> Except if it's clear. <laughs> well, I bought my AirPod case and I bought a little like beeper thing that attaches to it because if I'm going to lose something, I lose that, right? No. Do you know what I did? I attached a beeper thing oh, to that yes. and my keys. It's now run out of batteries. Do you, do you think I can manage to coordinate myself enough to buy more <gasps> batteries? Nope. <laughs> it's just if it gets lost next time it's just gone these are real problems people these are such real problems (laughs) so as much as alana and i could totally talk all day and we generally do I'm going to call this to an end, but I have some very exciting news, and that is that Alana is going to be a monthly guest on the podcast with me. Like your period. (laughs) Yes, uh, just like your period, (laughs) except far more welcome. Far more welcome, yeah, that's it. And joyful, (laughs) and joyful. So, yeah, no, I I just, I love this girl, and I love talking about this stuff with her, and I think, um, well, I hope you all do too, and too bad if you don't. (laughs) I'm here to stay. <laughs> no, but seriously. Yeah, she is. Uh, but we're, we've been keeping it pretty pretty tame uh, on this episode. But we're going to be doing uh, a couple of special episodes behind closed doors only for my 
Patreon VIPs, or as I like to call them, my Queen Peas, you know, Princess and the Pea theme. That's very cute. <laughs> I'm such I like a, that. I'm such a corn dog. No, it's ridiculous. I love that. Thank you. I, love that. I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but we're going to uh, do some a little bit more uh, personal and uncut. We're calling it Neuro Spicy. And uh, so she'll come on the, the official podcast monthly and we'll also have a behind the scenes one starting from next month. So stay tuned for that. And I hope you've enjoyed our little chat today. Bit of an intro into how we're currently feeling about the diagnostic process. <laughs> and yeah, we've just we've got a lot we want to say and hopefully some peeps want to listen. <laughs> Thank you for coming on and thank you for reaching out to me. I just had to have you as my first guest. I absolutely loved having you today and I can't wait to talk more with you and everyone should go buy her book, Talks Too Much, greatest title ever, and we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for having me. I can't wait for our next one. Well, that's it. Episode two is done. Don't forget to head over to the socials and connect. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next week. Over and out.